Damn it, Darren, what took you so long? Darren's wife, Melissa, cried. Darren came down the stairs of their house carrying her purse. He nervously handed it to her while her friends watched, smiling. Melissa was a petite blonde with amazingly deep green eyes. She hasn't gained an ounce since they met in college. Her small, firm breasts and slender figure made her look just as young as she did ten years ago, at thirty-two. Her friends, with the exception of Helen, were just like her. All women remained slim throughout their lives. Helen, on the other hand, was a little chubby. Her natural dark brown hair, unlike the others, was not bleached, and she did not wear a skirt that ended four to six inches above her knees. Darren again wondered why she communicated with them, and vice versa. He knew that Helen did not drink, unlike others who drank heavily, including his own charming wife. She may have been the designated driver. It was the only thing he could think of. Honestly, Darren, Melissa said, you should be glad I'm leaving. It helps me relax after being stuck in this damn cave all week. She was referring to their four-bedroom duplex home, the one she begged him for five years ago. Besides, my leaving gives you time to spend with your little friends, but you better not let any of them into my house. Now give me the money, she said. She took his wallet as soon as he took it out. And she took all his cash. If luck smiles on you, and I'm not too tired when I get home, you might get lucky. That is, of course, if I don't meet someone else. She started laughing, and besides Helen, so did her friends. Darren watched Melissa and her friends get into the brand new Honda he had just bought her and drive away. Darren cleaned up the house and left too. He drove halfway across town after loading his Jeep with tools and some auto parts he bought online. Melissa, why are you treating Darren so badly? Helen asked. He must really love you to put up with your crap. Don't you love him? You treat him more like a butler than a husband. Helen, whether she loves him or not doesn't matter. Marriage is all about control, Danielle said. Danielle was another very slim blonde in her thirties, except she was a few inches taller than Melissa and had two children. They could have been twins. Melissa is just trying to maintain control in her marriage. Helen still doesn't understand the rules, laughed Sandra the last member of the quartet who looked exactly like the rest. Helen, Sandra continued, as if speaking to a toddler. The wife makes all the rules. Melissa herself was strangely silent. She thought about what others were saying. In her own way, she truly loved Darren. They were together for more than ten years. He tried very hard to support her and make her happy. In fact, from the moment he began courting her many years ago, he went to any lengths, she asked. She knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that he loved her deeply. But there were still questions in her mind. It wasn't Darren's fault that he started dating her when she was still recovering from a really bad breakup. The other guy, Ryan, was one of the guys considered a big shot on campus. He surrounded her with attention and seduced her in a few days. He showered her with compliments, nurturing her self-esteem. He invited her to a romantic dinner at a very expensive restaurant. After dinner, he suggested a walk along the beach. It was a perfect evening. They had sex, at dusk, right on the same beach. He told her, of course, that he loved her. Even though the sex wasn't very good for her, it got its way. When she looked at the stars while he made love, she could almost see their future. They will have two children, a boy and a girl, and a beautiful duplex ranch home in a nice area. He apologized many times after that. He said that maybe they should have waited until their wedding night, or at least their engagement. His only excuse was that she was so sexy and he couldn't control his passion for her. He drove her home and kissed her on the cheek at the door of her dorm. He smiled when he promised to call her. When will you call? She asked. Somehow his words soon made her feel better. That night she dreamed about their wedding and their future. I hoped the sex would get better. The next day she sat by the phone, waiting for a call that never came. She told herself that he was just busy with school and the team. The next day there was still no call. However, that evening, just two days after he told her that he loved her, she saw him in a restaurant, 
staring dreamily into the eyes of another girl. As he kissed the girl, Melissa felt tears rolling down her cheeks. She was a fool, and she wasn't the only one who knew it. The next morning, in the dorm's common locker room, she overheard two other girls saying, Yeah, he got her too, right on the beach the first night of their date. From what I heard, he said she was terrible. Worst sex ever, he ever had. Melissa ran to her room and cried all day. It took her several days to return to classes. She didn't date at all for the rest of the semester. When she returned home for the summer, she only went out on group dates. The following fall, her senior year, she again refused to date anyone until she met Darren. He was so different from all the other men who courted her. He was so polite and clearly admired her. He was very sweet and also handsome. Even her best friends told her that she would be stupid to miss him, unless she liked boys. From the very beginning of the relationship, she presented him with almost insurmountable obstacles. When he went out of his way to overcome all these obstacles, she only persisted in her trials even more. Finally, she couldn't find a single reason not to date him. They went out alone with a group of her friends, and she actually had a good time. He tried so hard to win her over that she couldn't help but acknowledge his persistence, if nothing else. Their first date together ended not with a kiss or even a handshake, but with her stern warning that she had a good time. When she got home, she told her roommates about it, and they looked at her like she was crazy. He's a really nice guy, they told her. After courting her for a month and being a perfect gentleman, what did he have in return? They assured Melissa that he probably wouldn't call her for a second date. He tried too hard for nothing, they said, and he's a handsome guy with a good physique, smart and with good character. Some other girl will grab it. Her neighbor's words fell like pages from a Bible. The next day, not only did Darren not call her, but she found out that one of the other girls in her building had seen them returning from their date and had asked him out herself. Melissa looked into her heart and decided that she wanted Darren and wouldn't let anyone else have him. She called him and asked him directly why he didn't call her. She told him that she had been wondering where they could go on their second date. He must have really loved her. He was also a very honest man because within an hour of their phone conversation, another woman from their building was giving Melissa a dirty look. Melissa knew that Darren must have called this woman and canceled their date so he could go out with her. Melissa then began the pattern of behavior that characterized her relationship with Darren. She was always the one in control. She was never going to let anyone use her again. Whenever Darren was hesitant about something she wanted or asked, Melissa would give him a few crumbs to keep him coming back. She didn't let him kiss her until their fifth date. It was six months before she allowed him to touch one of her breasts over her clothes. And needless to say, they didn't have sex until their wedding night. Even after so many years of marriage, Melissa distributed sex whenever she wanted. Darren loved her so much that he simply never complained. These friends of his, however, began to change his mind. That damn computer engineer and his wife were interfering with her marriage. Darren became interested in cars and bought himself some kind of car to repair. He met several people who were interested in the same cars. He begged her to visit the home of these new friends with him. She agreed. More than anything, it was to see who they were and what influence they could have on her husband. Tim Matthews and his wife Elaine had a beautiful home and a lovely daughter, Krista. Melissa was shocked by the way they acted. Neither of them seemed to be in control of their marriage. They clearly loved each other very much. They have always been very close to each other. Melissa was shocked when Tim patted Elaine's ass several times right in front of her. All the woman did was look at him and smile, and she was clearly confused about how marriage should work. As they all gathered on the terrace watching the beautiful sunset, Elaine decided to sit on Tim's lap and start kissing him while they had guests. The woman couldn't get enough of this guy. She was beautiful, slender but still with curves. She had bigger breasts than anyone in Melissa's group and an incredible ass. As she mounted her husband and leaned in to kiss him, their daughter, who must have been about three years old, walked out onto the deck with the teddy bear and headed toward their garage. As the girl approached Tim's bright yellow muscle car, the car door opened and the little girl climbed inside. 
The door closed with a loud bang. Tim and Elaine looked at each other. Melissa was wondering how the car door opened and closed, but the child's parents didn't seem to be concerned, so why should she worry? She was more interested in the relationship between her parents. When Elaine sat on top of Tim, the man destroyed her dignity. He pulled her shirt out of her shorts and began massaging her soft belly right in front of them. And she purred as if she liked him groping her in public. Darren seemed to sense Melissa's shock, so he began talking to defuse the situation. What's Krista doing? He asked. Melissa was shocked that not only did her husband know the baby's name, but he was also interested in her. Perhaps that's why they were there. She's tired, Elaine laughed. She'll sleep with Chrissy until I put her to bed or her daddy does. Don't worry, she's safe where she is. Melissa noticed that Tim was still massaging his wife's belly. Elaine seemed to have contracted the shivers. She'll have to get used to the idea of having to share her secret place a little sooner, she said. Melissa saw Tim's eyes widen and he stared at Elaine. You mean that you... I mean we... Um... He stuttered. Yes, handsome. Elaine smiled. You're pregnant again. We're pregnant again. After that, the evening was almost over. Melissa noticed that Tim and Elaine as polite and friendly as they were, could hardly wait to get rid of their guests. She had a feeling they would end up in bed before she and Darren left. Even now, weeks after their meeting, the evening still haunted Melissa's thoughts. Hearing from Helen how much Darren loves her makes Melissa even more confused. She threw bachelorette parties whenever she and her friends wanted. Of the four women, only she and Helen were married. Helen and her husband had an open relationship. They had both had several affairs and were now starting to slow down and rediscover each other as they grew older. Melissa thought there was something wrong with Helen's marriage, but minded her own business. The other two were divorced. Melissa hadn't actually cheated on Darren yet, but she wasn't going to let him know that. To be honest, she didn't really enjoy the company of Danielle and Sandra, but she needed to go out regularly to show Darren that she wouldn't tolerate cheating on his part and that she could easily find another man. She needed him to know this because it helped her maintain control. However, seeing Tim and Elaine made her think, she rubbed her stomach absent-mindedly as she drove. Darren got out of his Jeep and began stacking boxes in front of Tim and Elaine's garage. When he finished, he slowly walked towards their front door and knocked softly. Elaine opened the door, and a smile lit up her face when she saw Darren. They had only known each other for a few months, but he had already become one of her husband's best friends. Whatever made Tim happy made Elaine happy. Hey, Darren, team had to work late, but you can start without him, she said. Um, maybe I'll just come back another day, Darren said sadly. Any day that suits you. You're always welcome, Darren, Elaine said. It probably won't work out for at least a week. I don't have many free evenings, Darren began. So why don't you stay today? Elaine asked. At least jack up the car and put on new wheels and tires. Your brake calipers look really good. Darren nodded. He liked Elaine and Tim. He wanted his marriage to be like theirs. In fact, he arranged a dinner with them so Melissa could see how they lived together. But after dinner... Melissa simply forbade him to invite them to their house. She said there was something strange about them, and Darren shouldn't allow himself to borrow ideas. When Melissa and her friends walked into the crowded club, they looked like something out of a bad teen dance movie as they walked toward a table. Tonight was Melissa's favorite night at the club. It was karaoke night. She loved listening to amateurs trying to impress the crowd. What was different about this club's version of karaoke was that the singers could choose a song from a list, but the music came from a live band. Melissa liked it too because she didn't have to spend most of the evening fending off the guys she was dancing with. Sandy and Daniel often slept with the guys they danced with. Most men thought she would too, given the right motivation and situation. Because of this, she never paid for drinks at the club. Helen, on the other hand, didn't dance. She told other women that her cheating days were over, and although her husband didn't mind if she danced with other men, 
She didn't think it was appropriate a behavior for a married woman. The first few performers seemed to know they were terrible. They wanted to get out and finish quickly while the crowd was still sympathetic and in the mood to reward courage. But after several singers, the audience mercilessly ridiculed the inept ones without guilt or compassion. Melissa was sitting at a table with a guy she knew. He was always trying to get her into bed. She actually let him kiss her and stroke her chest a couple of times, usually when she was really mad at Tim. But nothing serious has happened so far. The woman walked on stage to sing just as Sandy and some guy Melissa had never seen before returned to the table. Sandy's dress was a mess and her makeup was smeared and the guy was grinning from ear to ear. Melissa had no illusions about where they were. Oh, damn, Helen hissed. Relax, Helen. She does this all the time, Melissa said. Not her, Helen said. Look at the stage. A tall woman stood on stage holding a microphone. She had long, dark hair like Helen, but she was much slimmer. She had large breasts for her frame and long legs. Several guys in the crowd started booing before she started singing. I didn't know Jessica would be here tonight, Helen said. As they watched, Jessica began to sing. She was a good singer and literally captured the crowd's attention within minutes. When she finished the song, the crowd erupted and applauded. Your sister can sing, Melissa said. Yes, she tried to record an album once, but she couldn't find the right songs. None of the songwriters she worked with could write something that really suited her voice, Helen said. Also, music wasn't really what she was into. She only did music to be around her ex. She likes working on cars. A few minutes later, Jessica walked up to their table and hugged her sister. She looked around the table and saw the other three women. Only her sister sat alone. Danielle sat on the guy's lap. Sandy's makeup was smudged, and the guy sitting with her had bite marks on his neck, and his collar was smeared with lipstick the same color as Sandy's lips. Melissa kept pushing away her boyfriend's hands. When Melissa returned home, Darren was already asleep. Usually he would wait for her. She thought he was doing this to examine her, to make sure she wasn't sleeping with someone else, or to have sex with her if she was in the mood and wanted it. She felt especially strange after meeting the Matthews family. She thought about stopping the pills and letting Darren impregnate her. He looked so cute laying there, facing her side of the bed, that she wanted to just let it go. It would be so wonderful to truly and completely trust him with all my heart. But she knew what would happen. This was already clear to her in college, when Romeo used her and abandoned her. Never again would any man control or hurt her. She noticed that Darren, in addition to turning to her side of the bed, was holding her pillow to his face. It was as if he was trying to sleep while breathing in her scent. Damn, he really must love her. Her eyes watered thinking about it. Then she realized she was acting vulnerable again. Darren, why the hell didn't you put the dishes away? She screamed, waking him up. Oh, sorry, he muttered. I have to get up early for a meeting tomorrow and I went to bed late. I was tired from... I don't want to hear your weak excuses, she said mockingly. What I want is for my damn kitchen to be cleaned. He quickly got out of bed and headed to the kitchen. As he walked, Melissa looked at her husband. He really had a good physique. He was built much better than the idiot in the club. Part of the reason she woke him up was because she wanted him to get up so she could have sex with him. She lay down on the bed in only her panties and bra. Darren returned to the room a few minutes later. He looked at her lying on the bed with her eyes closed. His gaze focused on her mouth. Her lipstick was smeared. Not just lighter in some places, as if she had pressed her lips to the glass while she drank. She was smeared, as if she had kissed someone. Melissa was also very red around her chest, like... Darren didn't want to think about it. Sorry, he said. I don't... He quickly left the room. Melissa's eyes suddenly opened just as Darren was walking out of their bedroom. She thought that what she saw might not be anger, maybe it was desire. And just the thought that he was going to have sex with her made Darren so excited. She was sure he would return in a few minutes when he thought she was ready. The next morning, Melissa realized something was wrong. She fell asleep last night and Darren didn't come back to their room. What's worse is that he didn't come into their room to say goodbye in the morning and hoped for one of her rare goodbye kisses.
She tried to sort out his problems later. She had a full day of tanning and going to the gym ahead of her. She needed to keep herself in shape. He won't want her if she gets better. Darren arrived at his office early. He wanted to scream. But that wasn't his style. For more than ten years he endured Melissa's bullying. He allowed himself to be humiliated and hurt because he loved Melissa like there was no tomorrow. But he has reached his limit. He was sure that she had finally made good on her threat and spent the night with someone else. And worst of all, she came home and confronted him with it. He decided to end it. Surely being alone wouldn't be worse than being with Melissa. He called a friend who was a divorce lawyer. Ryan didn't seem surprised. Boy, I'm just surprised it took you so long, Ryan said. If we approach this the right way, we can get you out of this with your dignity intact. Ryan, I have no evidence that she cheated on me, Darren said. Boy, don't worry about it. Give me your address. I'll send people to install listening devices and cameras, Ryan said. I don't think she's bringing them here, Darren said. Darren, forget about this whole affair with cheating. This scheme is too hackneyed. The judges are fed up with it. All that cheating will get you is half of your things at best. Plus, considering that your wife, even with a higher education, has never worked, she'll probably end up with more of your stuff than you, Ryan said. Eventually, she'll move in with her lover at your house, and you'll pay for them to have fun in your bed while they drink your damn beer and laugh at you. Darren pictured this in his mind, and it raised his temperature a little, but he still didn't explode. We'll approach this completely differently, he grinned. Trust me, you'll like it. Darren still had some time before he actually had to come to work. He sat down in front of his computer and started trying to think of what he wanted to say to Melissa. He was going to write her a letter to tell her what his life had become and what a hell she had made of it. Maybe he'll even tell her that he knew about what she went through in college before she met him. He actually knew how Ryan had used her and abandoned her. He never mentioned it because he would have to tell her that even though he didn't meet her during the competition, he was part of it. Although he had never been dishonest with any of the girls he dated and only used those who were also only interested in a no-strings-attached relationship, he felt guilty. He thought he could let go of some of his guilt over the innocent women some of his friends had hurt by trying to help Melissa regain her confidence. He never expected to fall in love with her. Over the years he endured her abuse, hoping that one day she would understand how much he loved her and perhaps repay that love in some way. But last night was the last straw, the last humiliation he will endure for the sake of love. He also thought it was poetic justice to hire Ryan as his divorce lawyer. In college, he and Ryan were competitive but friendly. Ryan was an athlete. Darren was interested in music. When Darren tried to write his letter, for some reason it turned into a song or poem. You listen. You hear how I speak, how I sing. Open the door. It's less or more. When you tell me to be careful, are you here or there? Is there something I need to know? Easy comes, easy goes. Not in your head, can't hear the words I said. I can't communicate. When you wait, don't communicate. I'm trying to talk to you, but you don't even know. So what will happen? Tell me. Can you hear me? Patience is running out. Running out. Come again. Tell me I'll get the opposite. The opposite. Show me what reality is. If it breaks, can it be fixed? Open your ear. Why do you think I'm here? Keep me in the dark. Do you even think about me? Is there someone else above me? Need to know. Need to know. What should I do because I can't reach you? So what will happen? Tell me. Can you hear me? It wasn't bad, and it kind of reflected some of Darren's frustration and the things he wanted to say to Melissa. This was especially true of his desire for her to talk to him, or at least listen to him. However, something was missing. Darren thought no more about it. He decided to get to work. Maybe he could leave early and go to Tim and Elaine's. His car was almost ready. All it really needed was a paint job. When Darren returned home in the evening, Melissa was already there. She was lying on the sofa in their large living room wearing a very short skirt. Her legs were spread wide open, and Darren couldn't get the view out of his mind. He was sure she had probably spent the afternoon with someone she slept with. He almost hoped she did it here so Ryan's people would record it. He went to the office to check the internet for quality car paint. 
Melissa was furious. As soon as Darren entered the house, he took one look at her and left for his home office. She didn't sleep at all. She spied on him all the time. Her eyes were barely open. The plan was for him to walk in, take one look at her, and practically beg her to have sex. Or at least he would come up and start making obvious hints about it. After ten years together, he should have known how things worked for them. Is there something wrong with him? He actually looked at her. He did stare at her, but it wasn't the look she was expecting. It was more of a look of sadness or resentment. Then he went to the office. Darren! She screamed at the top of her lungs. When did you get home? Why didn't you start cooking dinner? Surprisingly, he didn't answer. She stood there for a moment, then walked to the office door. The door didn't open when she turned the knob. It was locked. In her anger, she kicked the door several times and left the house. Melissa went to see Danielle. She explained what happened when Darren returned home. Danielle laughed at this. Melissa didn't think it was funny at all. She began to wonder why she told Danielle about her problem in the first place. Maybe because she really needed someone to talk to, and someone was better than no one. Before they finished, Helen arrived. Melissa told the whole story again for Helen's benefit. Daniel and Helen seemed to have different perspectives on the situation. Danielle believed that Melissa had a lot of control over her husband, and that was a good thing. Darren was such a henpecked man that he couldn't even ask for sex, even if he wanted it. She told Melissa that the next step was for him to accept the fact that she could have sex with other men if she wanted, and there would be nothing he could do about it. Helen looked at Danielle like she was crazy. Daniel, what happened to your marriage? Helen asked. Well, um, Danielle began. I'm tired of sleeping with the same guy all the time, so I... Bullshit, Helen replied sharply. I was there. You were flirting with a bunch of guys, and your husband found out and left you. You begged him for months to give you another chance. Then he married a young, beautiful girl, and they now have two children. You were desperate and lost a lot of weight, and now you go out and sleep with random guys. In your mind, you think you're getting back at him this way, but he's moved on. And I'm happy for him because you're a bitch. You're just trying to ruin Melissa's marriage because your marriage is ruined. Get your fat ass out of my house, Danielle snapped. An hour later, Melissa was home and still confused. The doorbell rang and she went to answer it. It was Helen. Helen came in and they sat down to talk. Melissa, I've known you a long time and I want you to be happy. Don't listen to Danielle's bullshit. She always talks to you about control. It was her kind of control that destroyed her marriage. Marriage is not a battle. It should be a partnership. When this works well, both partners control together as equals. As Helen spoke, Melissa thought about Tim and Elaine. They were definitely equals. They loved each other so much that she couldn't imagine one without the other. The problem was that she didn't know how to do it or even how to get to this point from where she was now. You need to slow down with Darren and stop trying to control him so much. If you don't, he'll go crazy and you'll lose him forever. Just like Danielle's husband left her. Then you'll become a sad, bitter old woman like her, said Helen. Their conversation was interrupted by the doorbell. Darren walked out of his office just as Melissa was about to answer the phone. Hi, Darren, Helen said. How are you? Not very good, he replied. I can't find someone to paint my car. Helen realized that Darren was so depressed that he couldn't talk about what was really bothering him. She could tell he was upset, and it definitely wasn't about the car. She thought that maybe if she helped him with the car, she could get him to trust her. Then she could get him and Melissa to talk to each other before it was too late. Helen took a notepad from the table and a pen. She quickly wrote down the number. Her name is Jessica. Tell her I sent you and she'll offer a good price. Thank you, Darren said. Darren, I know we don't know each other, but you're a good guy. You can say no to Melissa sometimes and protect yourself. Sometimes you have to go a little crazy to save yourself, she added. Melissa returned to the room and saw them talking to each other. We have to go, she told Helen. Danielle has an emergency. Melissa looked around to see what Darren was doing because she wanted to tell him not to sleep this time. 
but he left. I'm going home, Helen said. Fuck Danielle and her problems. She told me to get my fat ass out of her house so I don't see any reason to go back there. Melissa arrived at Danielle's house and saw her friend lying on the couch with a compress on her head. She looked terrible. Sandra was with her, but got up to leave as soon as Melissa entered. Okay, you can stay with her. I have a date, Sandra said. Where is Helen? Danielle moaned. Remember when you told her to leave your house? Melissa said. That's not what I meant, Danielle exclaimed. Her ex-husband's new wife is pregnant again, Sandra said. Danielle's mother is still on good terms with him. Since his parents died, he treats her as if she were his mother. He and his new wife named the baby after Danny's mom and wanted her to be the godmother. She called and told Danny how stupid she was for letting him go. Melissa spent most of the evening with Danielle, listening to her friend talk about how her ex did similar things to make her unhappy. She really wished she had half the control over her ex that Melissa had over Darren. For the past day or so, Melissa has been torn. On the one hand, she truly loved Darren deeply in her own way. On the other hand, she knew firsthand what it was like to be used and thrown aside. She was also very angry with Darren because he didn't just melt at her feet and not have sex with her when she wanted. She decided that he needed to pay for this. Perhaps Danielle was right. Darren began trying to manipulate her. If he wasn't home and wasn't ready to meet her when she arrived, he better be careful because she might just do what she tried to make him think she was doing. Darren listened to the recordings made in the house. There was nothing interesting, at least for him. There were simply more instances of Melissa yelling at him. However, the conversation between Helen and Melissa was interesting, especially the part where Helen told Melissa that he might go crazy. Helen was good, he thought. She told him he could just go out and do what he liked. He called the number she gave him and spoke to the woman, who told him to come and talk about it. She gave him the address and he went to meet her. The address she gave him was a garage. Cars were repaired there. She showed him the paint booth. She also showed him a certificate of completion from a leading driving school. They returned to the office and she showed him samples of the work she had done. In one of the photographs he saw a familiar face. Tim stood with another guy in front of a Mustang with a custom purple paint job. Did you draw? He asked when he saw Tim. No, I didn't draw Chrissy, she said. But Tim seed if he ever needed to repaint it or touch it up, I could do it. Can you match this color? He asked. But with white stripes instead of black? Yes, she has said, instantly interested. They talked for some more time and discovered that they had a lot in common. Besides the paint job, she wanted to help him bring his vision for the car to life. In the background, he heard the sounds of guitar playing. Sorry, I invited some guys to the jam, she said. I really enjoyed talking to you, and not just about your car. I wish this didn't end. My sister has many friends, but no one is better than you. Actually, today was the first time I talked to your sister, so I wouldn't call us friends. She's friends with my wife, Melissa. As soon as he said Melissa's name... Jessica felt sorry for him. It was so stupid for her to be in clubs, letting men touch her tits and everything she did when she had a nice guy like him at home. She tried to hide her reaction, but she wasn't even close to succeeding. What? Darren asked after seeing how she looked when he mentioned Melissa's name. Nothing, Jessica said. I really have to go. We have a long night ahead of us. We're going to try to write something. Neither of us are songwriters. We love to play and are pretty creative with arrangements but writing comes hard for us. Can I stay and listen for a while? Asked Darren. Of course, if you want, Jessica smiled. It was magical. Jessica sat next to Darren and sang some songs he had heard on the radio. They tried a couple of songs that some or all of them wrote together. The original songs were just missing something. A couple of hours later, the guys left. You know what I mean? she said. I think we're a cover band at best. I'm not so sure, Darren said. Maybe all you need is the right song. People have been telling me that for years, she said. To be honest, music doesn't mean much to me. It's more like a hobby than a passion in my life. I'm just doing this to give gifts to my friends. If I didn't do this, they'd be holding auditions. 
find another singer, and life will go on. But you're so good at it, Darren insisted. Do you want something to eat? She asked, and then suddenly stopped. Sorry, I forgot you were married, she said. Not for long, I'm afraid. I have a lawyer working on my divorce papers as we speak, he said. So you already know? She asked. You know? I asked back. I am Switzerland, she smiled. I don't participate in other people's wars. This is not a war, Darren said. To start a war, there must be two sides fighting over something. It's more like a slave revolt or an act of emancipation. She looked at Darren strangely. Don't take my word for it. Please ask your sister about my marriage to Melissa, said Darren. Also, Melissa has made it clear over the past few months that she doesn't really want to be with me. The last few days have become really clear. It took me over ten years to realize something that the average guy could understand. I figured it out on the first date, Darren said. For more than ten years, it was a two-way traffic. Melissa's way or the highway, he grinned. It was never my way. Darren stayed there and just talked to Jessica for over two hours. They were always going to leave, but they never did. They talked about the failure of his marriage and the failure of Jessica's marriage. Her ex could never refuse fans, although his wife was much more attractive. When Darren finally returned home, it was almost midnight. Melissa sat on the couch with her arms crossed over her chest. She was wearing an almost see-through nightgown, but he could tell she was wearing it more to let him know what he wasn't getting than anything else. Where the hell have you been? She asked. I went to check if my car was painted, Darren said. I heard the music and lost track of time. If it matters, I'm sorry. You should have been here waiting for me to come back, she snapped. How was I supposed to know that, he asked. You never told me to be here. Well, that's what I wanted, she said. You should have known if you were here. What if I wanted something? So now I have to predict your whims too, asked Darren. He looked at Melissa like she was crazy and went upstairs. He took a bunch of clothes from his closet and drawers and moved them to the guest room. Melissa rushed up the stairs after him. Open the damn door, Darren, she screamed. I'm not done talking to you yet. In her mind, Melissa thought this evening had gone completely wrong. This was not at all what she wanted. But now she couldn't back down without losing some of her control. But I'm tired of listening to Melissa. I'm so tired of this. You never listen. You never listen he said. Darren suddenly fell silent. Melissa continued to rant through the closed door, but Darren's mind was elsewhere. He took out a pen and pad and scribbled down a few hasty words. Oh, damn, he thought. Wow. When Darren arrived at work the next day, he turned on his computer and looked at the words he had written the day before. He divided the poem into separate stanzas and added a chorus which he wrote last night during an argument with his wife. Looked good. He had the words, now he needed a melody and a riff. He also needed a bass. He didn't really worry about the drums because if he had a guitar riff and a melody, any drummer could keep up with it for his money. His secretary told him that Melissa was calling him. He told her to take the message. She looked at him as if he had grown a second head. Darren never refused a call from his wife. A few minutes later, she returned and gave him a message from Melissa, and he just shrugged. He picked up the phone and called Jessica. Hey, we haven't discussed how much you're going to charge me to paint my car, he said. You pay for the paint. I'll do it for free, she said. No, Jess, I can actually afford to pay, he told her. I know you can, but I just want to do something for you, she said. He could imagine her smiling even now. Okay. Then do you have a guitar? He asked. Not yours, but there's always a couple lying around somewhere. Why? She asked. I might have something for you, he said. Like what? She asked. Will you bring it today? She asked. All of Jessica's hesitation in pursuing a married man disappeared after talking with Helen. Helen asked Jessica to stay away from Darren, but if even half of what Helen told her was true, Melissa doesn't deserve him. I would like to, but I can't, he said. It's going to take a while to get this all sorted out, and I have something to do with my friends tonight. Believe me, if I could give it up, I would. Do you know Elaine Matthews? Tim's wife? Sure, 
Jessica said. Why? She's bringing my car today. Is that okay? He asked. Great. The sooner the better. In fact, Jessica was still in shock that he called her Jess. She liked it. And that he had something for her. Darren returned home a little earlier than usual. Melissa watched him as he entered the house and went upstairs to shower. He put on jeans and comfortable shoes. He put on a t-shirt and a light jacket. Then he went downstairs. Where the hell are you going now? Melissa asked. I didn't say you could go anywhere. I didn't ask your permission, he answered her sharply. I don't ask you where you go when you leave, so you have no right to ask me. What is wrong with you? She barked. We need to talk. Melissa, for ten years you didn't listen to a word I said. I loved you for so long that I probably didn't notice that you didn't love me. Or I hoped that someday you would stop punishing me for that that someone else did. But maybe it's time for me to let it go, he said. Melissa was stunned. She couldn't think of anything to say. Finally, too long after the door had closed and Tim had left, she said, I'm ready to listen now. Within an hour, Melissa had Sandra, Helen, and Danielle gathered in her living room. They convened a war council to decide what to do with her fugitive husband. Helen believed that Melissa should confess her feelings for Darren and try to start over as equals. She needed to tell him about her adventures at the club and let him know that it was her love for him that kept her from going further than she had gone. He thinks you're already cheating on him, Helen said. Who told you this? Melissa barked. My sister, Helen said. She's painting that car for him. I think she likes him, but I told her to stay away from him. To hell with it, Danielle said. You need to quickly regain your control. He's already trying to find a replacement for you. You need to let him know that you can replace him too. And like in any war, there must be an escalation of forces. He found himself a girlfriend, so you need to go and sleep with someone by letting them know you're going to do it. He'll beg you not to do it, and you'll have control again, she said. What if he doesn't beg her? Helen asked. Then she'll look stupid and lose even more of her precious control. No, stupid, Danielle snapped. If he doesn't beg her not to do it, then she will do it. She can always say that she warned him that she was going to do it, and by not telling her not to do it, he gave her permission. You're stupid, Helen said. If she sleeps with another man, she will lose him forever. Look what happened to you, and all you did was flirt with some guys. Or did you lie about it too? Get your fat ass out of my... Danielle began. This is not your house, bitch, Helen snapped. Darren, Tim, and Elaine were walking around the fairground. Tim introduced Darren one by one. They were all surprised by the large number of Mustangs on display. They were at the first joint meeting of all Mustang clubs in the state this year. Darren really enjoyed it. He looked at cars and got an idea of what he would like to do with his car. Tim introduced Darren to some of the 50 members of his club. What made Tim's club special was that all of its members drove yellow Mustangs. Darren was amazed. He learned that there was a Black Mustang Club, a Shelby Owners Club, a Roosh Owners Club, and many others. Essentially, if there was a type of Mustang, there was a group of people who liked it. Walking around the fairground, Darren watched Tim and Elaine. He was jealous of how they were together. Now he knew even more that he would never have such a relationship with Melissa. This made him even sadder. Hey, why couldn't you give me my surprise today? Tim turned around and saw Jessica standing behind him. He hugged her with all his might. She wrapped her arms around him and pressed herself even tighter to him. He felt her breasts pressed against his chest. He barely managed to push himself away. Well, that was awkward, she said. Sorry, I wasn't thinking, he said. I was so glad to see you. Hi, Jessica. Elaine smiled. Jessica waved back and hugged Krista. Jessica joined them for the rest of the evening. When it got dark, they sat on the grass and watched the fireworks. Darren watched Tim and Elaine again. He loved the way she took his form as they sat together, and how their daughter climbed onto their common knee and fell asleep, not caring about anything in the world. Are you jealous? asked Jessica. Very, he replied. Me too, she said. Darren did not see Jessica for the next few days. Either she was busy or he was. 
Each of them gave all their strength to the other. Jessica completed the base layers and color layers on Darren's machine. She applied an incredible number of layers of varnish until the car was so shiny it was hard to believe. Darren finished the song. Meanwhile, his marriage to Melissa had gotten to the point where they weren't even trying to talk to each other. Helen urged Melissa to put Danielle's stupid plan aside and just talk to Darren before it was too late. Darren finally called Jessica. Tonight, he said. Don't you want to get a divorce first? She asked. Ha ha ha, he replied. Ryan actually prepared my divorce papers. I just need to choose the day and method to serve them. So, what's going on tonight? She asked. You will receive your gift, he said. Well, you can pick up your car tonight too, she said. I know you still need to add your own grill and a couple other touches, but it's done and it's beautiful, she said. You can take it for the first ride when it's ready, he said. See you tonight, she said. Darren was looking forward to something more than just his car for the first time in a long time. As he prepared to leave the house, Melissa walked into the living room. She was wearing a dress that ended just below her butt. If she sat or even stood too long without pulling it down, her panties could be seen. Don't wait for me, she said. I'm leaving too, he said. Don't bring anyone into my house and let him use a condom. Although on second thought, it's not that important, considering that we haven't had sex in a long time and are unlikely to ever do it again. So forget about the second part. But don't take him to my house. As Darren walked away, Melissa seemed to hear him singing a song. What should I do now, she wondered. She wasn't going to go out in that dress. She wanted Darren to tell her she couldn't wear it or ask her to stay home. She was even willing to change her clothes, if he asked. Darren pulled up to the garage. As soon as he approached the door, it swung open. Jessica ran out to him before he could touch her. Apparently, she was waiting for him. She looked him over as if she was looking for something. Then she shrugged and smiled at him. Come on, you have to see this, she said. Darren noticed that Jessica was looking at him as if he were the only man in the world, the only person. There was only joy in her eyes. Darren clearly liked her being herself. She judged Darren by his actions, not by what anyone else did to her. When they entered the garage, she stood on her tiptoes and covered his eyes with her hands. She began to try to guide him to the painting booth, but their height difference made it difficult for her to guide him and keep her hands on his eyes. Out of frustration, Darren bent down, picked her up, and carried her. Tell me where to go, he said. Darren smelled a floral scent coming from Jessica's long, dark hair. Her perfume or soap was very light. He was tempted to lower his nose to her skin to really inhale the scent. But he didn't do it because he didn't want to go too far. Darren, you're afraid, aren't you? Asked Jessica. He nodded and she laughed. He liked the sound of her laughter. It wasn't artificial or fake. It was just the natural sound of a happy woman. You have nothing to be afraid of, she said. It's completely natural to feel this way. I think we should always acknowledge our feelings and follow them. But I haven't served her with divorce papers yet, he said. That would be wrong. I can't do that. Honey, I was talking about your car, she said. I thought you might be worried that I ruined your paint job. What were you talking about? Sorry, Darren said. I'm just probably confused. You smell so good and it feels so good to feel you that I just started imagining that. You're not imagining anything, Darren. I really hope something happens between us. My sister would really kill me if that happens. She's trying so hard to save your marriage, Jessica said. There's nothing to save, Darren said. She came out tonight wearing a dress so short you could see her underwear even when she was standing. She almost told me she was going to sleep with some guy. I just told her not to bring him home. Our entire marriage consisted of her trying to make sure no one would hurt her. She never put much of herself into it. Then, darling, why are you crying? asked Jessica. Let it all go. Let her go. Move on with your life. There's a better life waiting for you. Just let go of the old one. Darren nodded again. Now let's look at that car, she said, covering his eyes with her hands again. Darren walked through the garage with Jessica as his eyes. He followed her directions until he realized they were in the paint booth. His nose told him when they got there. 
The smell of paint and chemicals was overwhelming. Jessica removed her hands from his eyes and he carefully opened them. The car was beautiful. Although it was still the same flashy yellow as Tim Chrissy's car, it looked even brighter. The color seemed like it just jumped out of the car. I applied the white base coat before the yellow, Jessica said, smiling. It really makes the color pop, and the stripes you wanted are painted on, not glued on. They match the detailed stripes around the car. Darren was so happy he didn't even think about it. He just kissed her. Jessica, although she wanted to kiss him, held back at first. Before she knew it, she was kissing him back with a passion she never knew she had. Helen will definitely kill me for this, she said. Then she started kissing him again. While she was kissing him, she began to run her hands over his body. She felt a lump in his jacket pocket and pulled it out. Darren, what is this? She asked in surprise. It's not what I think it is, is it? It's too early for that. We don't even know each other that well. She found a small square box in Darren's jacket pocket. She looked like she came from a jewelry store. Open it, Darren said. Jessica held her breath and opened the box. There was a ring inside, a big white ring. The ring was made by folding a piece of paper into a long, flat strip and then forming it into a loop. Very funny, she said, hitting him. I almost died of a heart attack. I thought, well, you know what I thought. What would you say if this was a real ring? He asked. You'll have to propose to me to find out. She grinned. So, what is it really? This song is for you, he said shyly. Oh, a lot of guys have told me they want to write songs about me, she said. But usually it's just to see if they can get me into bed. This is the first time a guy wrote a song. In fact, this is the first time I even got a song. Usually when they find out I'm not easy behavior, the song does not appear. Jess, this is not that type of song. This is not a song about you. This is a song for you, Darren said. He walked to the corner and picked up an acoustic guitar. The staccato opening bars of the song began to play, and Jessica began to look at him differently. She looked at the words on the page and began to hum. After they went through the song a few times, she had a completely different look on her face. She was scared. She called a few of her friends and arranged a rehearsal for the next night with her full band. Darren took her for a ride in his freshly painted car. It was a pleasant night, so he lowered the top. His car may not have had the power of Chrissy, but the convertible made the ride enjoyable. When Darren returned home, Melissa was lounging on the couch, sleeping. She was still wearing the dress she had put on when Darren left. She was without underwear. He quietly went upstairs and packed a few personal items into his overnight bag. He sat at his desk for a few minutes and finally wrote her the note he told himself he would write days ago. He went downstairs and left a folded note next to her. Despite her appearance, Darren was shocked that she was still so beautiful. Despite his anger at her and the way their relationship was going, he loved her so much it hurt. He wished there was some way to overcome this, but now it is the end. She threatened several times to go out and sleep with someone, but she finally did it. There was no turning back now. Tears welled up in his eyes and rolled down his face. He kissed her tenderly one last time and left. By the time she came to her senses, he had already left. She was too drunk to get up, so she went back to sleep, thinking she dreamed that Darren was there and crying. Darren checked it into a motel. He fell asleep on the hard and uneven mattress in his room. He tossed it and turned it all night and could not sleep. He was confused. On the one hand, it hurt him that he loved Melissa so much to find out that she just went out and slept with some guy. There was no way he could survive this. On the other hand, he liked kissing Jessica. It wasn't like the kisses he'd had with Melissa in the last ten years. Jessica put everything she had into the kisses. Her kisses seemed to tell him that she was giving herself completely to him. Kissing Melissa was like kissing through a wall. It seemed like there was always something between them that prevented them from being truly together. How could he love his wife if he liked kissing another woman better? It didn't really matter anymore because from that night, he no longer had a wife. The next morning, Darren called his secretary and said he was taking a couple of days off to deal with personal issues. He called his lawyer and got a copy of his divorce papers. 
there were two sets of documents, one set indicating the reasons for adultery, treason, the other, mental violence and cruelty. Darren was still undecided on how to file for divorce. Ryan told him the reason didn't matter. They sought a better agreement and Darren's freedom. Darren felt bad at the thought of leaving Melissa homeless, defenseless, and without a livelihood. He wanted to give her at least enough money to get her life together until she got back on her feet. Ryan assured him that they would in fact negotiate an agreement with Melissa and her lawyers. But if they start from a completely hard line, where they concede a few little things so Melissa and her lawyer can save face, they will still win. Ryan also reminded him that Melissa treated him like a jerk for over a decade, so he had no reason to feel sorry for her. On some level, she deserved it. Melissa woke up feeling very sad and with a huge headache. She knew she shouldn't have drunk so much last night. Drinking was the cause of the headache. She could not understand the reason for the deep sadness she felt. Of course, her marriage was on the brink, but she was sure that it could be saved. She knew she treated Darren badly, but she was just trying to protect herself. The problem is that she has realized over the past few days that her defense has failed. She loved Darren deeply, but she just didn't know how to tell him. She was locked into the pattern for so long that it was difficult to break it. Will losing him be even harder? She asked herself this and a hundred other questions while sitting on the sofa. She decided to take a shower and just invite him to lunch so they could finally talk about their problems. He had stopped taking her calls over the last day or so, but if she just showed up, it would be hard for him to avoid talking to her. As soon as she reached their bedroom, everything fell apart. She noticed that all of Darren's drawers were open. His closet was also very empty. Many of his favorite business suits were gone. In the bathroom, she saw that his shaving kit and all his toiletries were gone. They were all there when he left last night, but she never left the house. She tried to focus on what happened. Damn, she'll never drink again. Right after Darren left, after he told her not to bring anyone home, she was so angry that she started drinking. On some levels, what Darren said to her in anger was funny. If only he knew how stupid he was. The part about not letting the guy she slept with into their house was funny. He was the only man she slept with. She's only been with two men in her entire life. That terrible Ryan in college who had messed with her head so much that it was still affecting her now. The second was Darren himself. She let a few men in the club touch her breasts over her clothes, but that was it. Anyone who even tried to touch her below the waist through her clothes was rejected. Darren was such a fool. She started telling him all these things about sleeping with another guy just to keep him on edge and to control him. However, something funny was happening. There was a voice in her head telling her that she was in danger or that she was missing something. Then she remembered. Darren actually came home last night. She remembered him kissing her, and she vaguely remembered him saying something and crying. Maybe he was crying because he was stupid enough to believe that she slept with someone else. Suddenly her phone rang, and she wandered over to answer it. It was Helen who was shouting at her. Helen! Please stop yelling at me, I have a headache. You only live a few miles from here. Why don't you just come over instead of yelling at me on the phone, she said. Melissa went upstairs and took a shower. She put on a pair of casual pants and a nice blouse. She didn't put on makeup because she was going to change before going to lunch with Darren. She let Helen in when she rang the doorbell. You look like a deed moosey, Helen said. Thank you so much, Helen. That's why you're my best friend. Melissa replied sharply. You always cheer me up. If I'm your best friend, why don't you ever listen to me instead of listening to idiots? Helen asked. I really hope you're proud of yourself. But let me ask you, who are you going to find who will be better? Melissa looked at Helen with confusion. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm happy for my sister. If you're stupid enough to do this, I hope things work out for her and Darren. I'm interested in what happens to you. Helen, what? Melissa asked. Let me finish. You always listen to them. This time I would like to speak, Helen said. I know I'm older than you and fatter and maybe not as pretty, but you'll soon be in my place. When I was younger, I was even wilder than you, and I was married at the time. My husband George and I both experimented a bit. Helen looked at the floor. Melissa, I was drunk, and 
let another man seduce me. George couldn't handle it. I thought we were getting divorced. A friend of ours convinced George that he should sleep with someone else to balance the scales. After he did it, and he did it to one of my girlfriends, things still weren't the same. George said it was because he did it with my knowledge and consent, and in my case, he had no choice. He slept with someone else, then I did the same thing. Next thing I knew, we were in an open relationship. I felt more like a slut than anything else, but I stuck with it because everything, it was my fault. I never wanted to be with anyone but George. It just happened when I was drunk and one of our friends, who was also drunk, took advantage of the situation. George always loved me too much to cheat on me, and we went on like that for two years. That night was the last straw. He left me to get a divorce. He gave me everything, including the house. He just never wanted to see me again. Me. The first thing you should know is that I never wanted to have any connections. I never wanted us to have an open relationship. I thought that was what George wanted. But while we were doing it, I thought that if he wants to have sex with a bunch of women, then I'll do the same with a bunch of men. Like you and those idiots, I wanted it to be equal. What's good for the goose is good for the goose. The biggest shock, however, was mine. I read George's note and I just couldn't stop crying. He never had anything to do with my friend. He just made her lie and say he slept with her to help us get over it. What did I do? He never had any other relationships and he never slept with any women. I later went back and checked all this. George only agreed to an open marriage because he felt I didn't need one. He hoped that by having all the sex I wanted, Maybe I'd get over it. Men are very vulnerable, and he thought the first time I slept with someone else because he couldn't satisfy me. I was devastated. I didn't want a divorce, and I never wanted to sleep with a bunch of men, but it happened. I was lucky. It took a lot of tears and begging and over five years of therapy, but George and I are still together. He's my best friend, and he loves me, but it's not the same love that it was before. Our sex life is terrible. Sometimes we don't touch each other for months. When we have sex, it's mechanical and always in the dark. I don't think he enjoys it at all, but he loves me and really wants us to be together. But I know that every time he looks at me, he sees me with these other men. And I know that eventually he will probably leave me. It's only a matter of time. And I love him so much, I think I'll die when this happens. The only way to have control in a marriage is to give up control. Do everything possible and impossible for your spouse and he will do the same for you. If you give this person your heart completely, he will never need anyone else or anything else. Danielle is so upset that her ex married someone else that she's trying to punish him by sleeping with other guys. But he doesn't care what she does. He's gotten over her and is in love with his new wife. Danielle is so lonely, it's pathetic. That's why she calls us and begs us to come to her and go out to the clubs. She doesn't even understand that if she continues to do what she's doing now, she'll end up a lonely old slut if she's lucky. If she's unlucky, she's going to die from some disease. She's trying to make you like her so she won't be lonely. Sandra has started trying to get her life back together. She's still going out with us, but she's dating every guy she can, hoping to find one who will stay. Have you noticed that her standards are dropping? Soon her only requirement will be to have a pulse. That's why I don't understand why you're doing this. Darren is a great guy and he loves you madly. Why give him up? Helen, thank you for your life story and your analysis of our friends, but I think you're crazy, Melissa said. Darren and I still have problems, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to give up some control, but that doesn't mean we're getting a divorce. I'm going to go to his office and have lunch with him today to talk about our problems, Melissa said. She noticed Helen shaking her head. That won't happen. Helen said. Melissa, do you remember my little sister? Hardly. The girl who sang at the club, right? Melissa said. She is prettier than all of us and better built, said Helen. She's got all this wild brown hair that men love to play with. She has that wild girl next door charm. Men fall in front of her and she doesn't even notice. I'm jealous of her and you're stupid. Why am I stupid? Melissa asked. Because right now she's the one who's helping your husband get over what you did last night. She's crazy about him, and after your divorce, she might end up with him. You can't compete with her. You and your friends are bony and fashionable. Men don't like it. It makes other women jealous, but men like curves. 
Jessica has bigger breasts and a better butt than any of you, and her waist is still thin, Helen said. She just painted his car and swept him off his feet. He wrote her a song that she really likes. They make memories every day. You have ten years of history with him, but that doesn't help. For most of those ten years, you deprived him and treated him poorly. I think last night was the last straw, Helen said. What's the last straw? Melissa asked, shocked. Last night you went out and slept with some guy like your friend suggested. To keep control, Helen smirked. I didn't leave the house last night. I stayed here, got drunk, and fell asleep on the couch, Melissa said. Darren called Jess this morning and told her that you slept with some guy and stayed on the couch to let him know. He left you and is filing for divorce. He's so upset he didn't go to work today. Actually, in fact, he's going to leave town for a few days to get over it all, Helen said. What should I do? Melissa asked. She was shocked. Now everything has fallen into place. First of all, don't let him leave. If he goes somewhere and starts ruminating about everything, he may decide to just settle scores with the past. You weren't the perfect wife. On the other hand, if he leaves, Jess will go with him. You're finished, Helen said. I guarantee you, if the two of them went to some little cabin on a lake to go fishing, he'd be caught. By the time they got back, he wouldn't even remember you, let alone be upset about you. You! Helen nodded her head. She knew her sister well. What you should do is get on your knees and beg for his forgiveness, Helen said. All these control games have only spoiled you. Give him some time as a leader. Melissa took the note Darren left. She read the note while Helen ran around the house making phone calls and preparing some kind of cocktail in the kitchen. Helen was right about everything. Melissa began to cry hysterically. She didn't want to lose Darren, but with her control games and manipulation, she may have already lost him. Drink this, Helen said to Melissa, holding out a glass of what looked like a green smoothie. What is this? Melissa asked. Don't ask, said Helen, but it will help you recover from your hangover faster. Darren was stunned. He didn't think he could play that damn song again. He wished he had never written it. He didn't belong here either. These people were not his friends. They were nothing more than a loose group of people who liked to play music. No wonder they couldn't write their own songs. All their brain cells were burned out. Then he saw Jessica's smile. She was like a star sapphire among a pile of manure. She outdid everything around her. He wrote this song for her, and if she wanted to perform it, that's why he was here, playing this song over and over again until it was perfect. Can we do this again? Jessica asked. I really want to work on the chorus. Darren simply smiled and nodded. Taking the day off was a good idea. There was no way he could concentrate on his work with thoughts of Melissa's betrayal running through his mind. He still couldn't figure out what he had done wrong. He loved this woman with all his heart and soul. Long after his guilt over what Ryan did to her had subsided, long after he realized that he was not responsible for what happened to her, the love continued. He always hoped that sooner or later she would get out of her pain and reciprocate his feelings. When that didn't happen, he came up with excuse after excuse for her. In the end, he just decided that in her own way she loved him. She just wasn't very demonstrative. But that was enough for him. Then she started hanging out with this group of harpies and things got worse. He couldn't seem to do anything right. She even began to humiliate him in front of them. Again, he tolerated it because he loved her. But her story about how she was going to go out and sleep with someone else and then do it was the last straw. In all the days of their marriage, he never thought about another woman. Darren's fingers slid lightly over the strings, muting them to produce the staccato notes of the opening bars. As Jessica sang, she walked up to him. He listened to her, playing, although he knew the words very well. It wasn't Jessica's words and feelings. After all, it was just a song for her. No, the words and feelings were Darren's. This was what he so desperately wanted to tell Melissa. Jessica was just his voice. He only wished there was a way for Melissa to hear the song and understand how much pain and frustration she had caused him over the years. But now, it is all over. 
What she did last night ended any hope of saving their marriage, performing tonight. This one song will mark the beginning of Darren's future and the end of his marriage. Darren planned to have Melissa served with divorce papers at home today. Jess came up with a much more poetic plan. She said it would be more symbolic. Helen had been calling Jessica tirelessly since early morning. Now, sitting in Dr. Harkness's waiting room, she tried again. Helen arranged an urgent meeting with Agatha Harkness for Melissa. This woman should have been in therapy years ago. Helen hoped Melissa could sort out her problems before she lost Darren forever. Finally, someone answered the phone. Hi, sister, Jessica said. Jesse, do you know where Darren is? Helen asked. I'm pretty confident I could find him if it was important, Jessica said. Damn it, Jesse. He's with you now, isn't he? Jesse, you promised to wait for me? Helen began. It's out of my hands, Jessica said. Besides, I promised to stay away from him until their marriage was over. And after the way she treated him and what she did to him last night, their marriage is over. Please tell me things haven't gone too far yet, Jessica. You haven't... Helen began. Of course not. I'm not like his damn wife. I'm not the type of woman who goes to clubs and lets strange men touch her breasts. I don't tell my man that I'm going to sleep with another guy and expect him to like it, Jessica said. Jessica, where is he now? She needs to talk to him, Helen said. I don't think he ever wants to talk to her again, Jessica said. But right now he's coming out to add some finishing touches to his car. If she wants a chance to talk to him, her best chance is tonight at your club, the one where I sang last week. I'll be there tonight to experience the song he wrote for me in front of an audience. We'll be there, said Helen. Sister, you and your little gang are lecherous. You better dress for the occasion or you won't be allowed in. There will be a lot of people there tonight. It will be something special. Helen wondered what her sister meant by special. This, however, did not matter. They were all attractive women and had never had trouble getting inside before. Inside the office, Agatha Harkness carefully studied her new patient. Agatha knew that sometimes people thought of her more as a witch than a psychiatrist. She could do things in therapy that were almost magical. She could save marriages and relationships that others had already written off. However, she would probably have to be a real master of the magical arts to handle this case. As she listened to the story of the crying, almost hysterical woman, she was shocked. For ten years, this woman psychologically abused her husband, and he tolerated it. If the circumstances had been the other way around, Agatha knew she would have advised any woman who endured such treatment to run away and never look back. However, she felt a little hypocritical because here she was, listening to the woman talk and trying to find a way for her to come to terms with her problem. The bad thing is that Melissa still doesn't seem to realize that she's the problem. She continues to claim that she knows she didn't treat Darren very well, but that still doesn't give him a reason to just freak out and divorce her without warning. Melissa still thinks her treatment of Darren was justified because some college wolf dumped her. Okay, Melissa, Agatha said. I think I've heard enough of your story to know where we're going. I need to ask you a few questions. This is fine? Melissa nodded her head. Melissa, was Darren that guy in college who hurt you and left you? asked Agatha. No, it was Ryan, Melissa said. There was tension in her voice even when she said his name. So your behavior now is partly a defense mechanism against what happened to you then. You want to make sure this never happens to you again, right? I think so, Melissa said. And you also want a little revenge for your humiliation, don't you? Asked Agatha. Maybe, Melissa said. Do you treat all men this way or just the one who hurt you? Asked Agatha. It would be foolish to feel this way against every person, Melissa said. I don't hate men. I feel quite comfortable with them. That's right. You let some of them meet you in clubs, you said. What about your husband? Does he often tout your body in public? Asked Agatha. Of course not, Melissa said. It would be awkward. I would never let him. But you let strangers do it, said Agatha. This is different. When these men do it, it's because they just want me. They want to use me. 
All they want is sex, and they will never get it. But Darren loves me, so he should know better. He should respect me, Melissa said. So what you do at the club is a way to prove that you won't let the wrong person hurt you again, asked Agatha. Maybe, Melissa said. She never thought about it. Why did you have sex with Ryan? asked Agatha. Why did you choose him? Well, he was handsome, and he said things that made me believe that he would be with me forever, and we will have the life I have always dreamed of. I thought he loved me, but it was just a lie so he could have sex with me and then leave me, and everyone at school knew how stupid I was. It was humiliating. Okay, what then? asked Agatha. After that, did you meet often? No, Melissa snapped. The only guys who asked me out after that thought I was easy to win. What about Darren? Did he think you were easy? asked Agatha. I made him wait a few weeks before going on a date with him, Melissa smiled, and he was very respectful. Melissa, everything you wanted from Ryan, they're very similar to what you had with Darren, even the type of house you wanted. That's a coincidence? Or did Darren want the same thing? asked Agatha. Melissa laughed. Darren doesn't care where we live or what. He just wants to be with me, Melissa said. Did he ever force you to have sex with him or hit you? Asked Agatha. Of course not, Melissa replied sharply. Darren loves me. Has he ever abused you or abused you psychologically? Asked Agatha. Has he ever cheated on you or put other women before you? Oh no, he knows better than that. I would never put up with anything like that, Melissa said loudly. Of course, said Agatha. So why do you think Darren did this? You told me he looked good. Why do you think he put up with you doing the exact things you wouldn't tolerate for so long? I think you are the luckiest woman in the world. Something bad happened to you. Bad things happened to everyone. But you never got over it. Part of growing up is learning to move on after tragic or difficult times. You went off to college as a young girl with stars in her eyes and romantic notions. There you ran into a scumbag who you thought could give you the fairy tale life you wanted. When he revealed himself to be a scumbag, you wanted revenge. So you spent ten years making the guy who truly gave you everything you wanted pay for something he didn't. Melissa's jaw dropped. Her eyes widened and she started to say something but couldn't find the words. If you had met your husband first, you would have a perfect life, wouldn't you? Asked Agatha. Yes, Melissa hissed. So your husband is being punished not only for how badly some guy treated you in college, but also because you couldn't wait until you met the right person. He has to pay because you can't find the one who wronged you. He should also pay because you can't blame yourself for letting the wrong person into your life. Agatha shook her head. Stranger men in bars and clubs may touch you in public, but the one man who loved you and put up with your antics for over a decade has to wait for you to give him permission to show you his love. Is that why you're here? Dr. Harkness, it's really not as bad as you make it out to be, Melissa said. Darren and I have sex all the time, at least once a month. If I could just figure out what the problem is with him and how to fix it, things could go back to normal. Melissa, leave my office. Come back when you're ready to face reality. I can't believe I'm saying this. It's really unprofessional but I hope your husband actually leaves you. A few minutes later, Melissa left the office in a rage. Helen stood up when she saw her friend leaving the office. This woman is a charlatan, exclaimed Melissa. She doesn't know her stuff. She can't fix me, let alone fix my husband. What was she thinking? What did she say? Helen asked. I told her how Darren has been acting weird lately, with all this talk about divorce and everything. So she sat me down on the damn couch and started asking me a bunch of questions about my marriage and my life. She seems to be thinking that I'm the problem, Melissa said. Melissa, I know you don't believe Dr. Harkness, but I'm your friend. Do you remember what I thought you should do? Helen asked as they got into Melissa's car. You told me I should kneel before him, Melissa said without emotion. I didn't mean that literally. Helen said. What I meant was that if you want to keep him, you're going to have to start doing things that will make him happy in the future. He's always been happy until now, Melissa replied sharply. No, Melissa, he wasn't, 
Maybe he was happy to be with you because he loves you. But I don't think he was ever happy with the way you treated him. No one would be. Let me ask you a question. There is no one here except us. I will never tell anyone the answer you give me. But you must be honest, okay? Okay, Melissa answered hesitantly. Why do you want Darren back? Helen asked. And how important is this? This is very important, Melissa said. I guess I didn't realize it until the last few days. I always thought I could control my feelings for him and keep him at arm's length. It actually started about a month ago. Darren forced me to accompany him to visit these terrible people. Tim and Elaine, whatever their name is. They were hugging each other and they had a baby. And they looked at each other like no one else on the whole damn planet mattered. Tim and Elaine Matthews? Helen asked. Oh, God. You're lucky they didn't start making out right in front of you. Anyway, they were in the kitchen and I heard her tell her husband that she thought Darren was really cute, but that I was a jerk, Melissa said. Melissa, you are, Helen said. And you know that look you saw Tim and Elaine give each other. Darren looks at you the same way. But if you don't get your head out of your ass, he'll stop missing you and start looking at someone else in the same way. My little sister is quite wild, but she has some principles. She won't actually go after him until you have the divorce papers in hand. But believe me, she won't wait until the divorce becomes official. And while you're sitting there hoping he'll come back to you, she'll literally be holding on to him every chance she gets. As long as you hope he remembers how you sometimes let him seduce you when you really wanted to. That girl will have sex with him every night until he can't move. You have one advantage right now. It's the fact that he's loved you for so long. You're almost a part of him. Right now, the balance is tipped in your favor, but every day the situation becomes a little more equal between you and my sister. Now, when he thinks about you, he still sees you lying on your couch. He still thinks that you cheated on him with someone else, and it causes him a lot of pain and suffering. When he sees her, he thinks about how she painted his car and how he wrote her a song and she helps him forget you. Very soon you will be equal in his eyes. If the comparison between you and my sister ever becomes almost equal, Melissa, you will lose. I already told you that she is more beautiful than us and better built. She is also ready to do anything to win this man. That girl has already done her fair share of mischief and is ready to settle down and start having children. Not with my husband, Melissa screamed. Helen called Sandra and Danielle. Both women were already expecting to go to the club. After all, it was their favorite night to go clubbing. They all agreed to meet at Melissa's house as usual. Sandra told them that this evening would be her last night at the club with them. She met a man on one of her dates that she really liked, and he didn't really like that she went to clubs all the time. So you're going to leave us for some guy? Asked Danielle. Look, the only reason we even go to clubs is to meet someone, right? Sandra said. Most of the time we meet idiots and losers, so we come back next week. I think I found a good one. He's not perfect, but who is he? So, yeah, if you want to put it that way, I'm leaving you. We'll still meet and visit each other, but I'm not going out when I already have what I want. Are you going to let some guy control you? Danielle asked in surprise. Hell yes, Sandra said. The way this man makes me feel, he can make me do whatever he wants. If you weren't so angry because your ex-husband's new wife is younger and prettier than you, you'd be jealous of me. Bullshit, Danielle snorted. I will always be in control. I will never give it up. Well, I hope that your control will keep you warm at night. And when you're miserable, maybe your control will hug you and tell you that everything will be okay. We're getting older, Danny. It's time for us to grow up. In a few years, my boyfriend will be hugging me and telling me he doesn't care if my ass gets bigger. He loves me and our kids will too. You'll be a lonely, angry old woman with control. But without a man... What will you really be in control of? Melissa, you've been sleeping alone for a few nights, and Darren has been doing things for about a week that have really annoyed you. You're losing control over your husband. What do you miss most? How does he do everything you tell him? Or how does he come and hug you when you're in bed? Oh God, please don't let me be late, Melissa sobbed. 
When they arrived at the club's parking lot, they realized there was a problem. The parking lot was closed, but there were still plenty of empty spaces visible. There was also a line that stretched almost the entire block. What the hell is going on? Danielle asked. I told you we should have arrived earlier. Helen snorted. I told you Jesse said today would be something different. They got out of the car and walked past the line. The guard, who usually let them in, waved them back to the line. We won't get inside for hours at this rate, Sandra said. Helen stepped aside and took out her phone. She started talking to someone and then started smiling. We're inside. Let's go, she said. She returned to the same guard and handed him her phone. He talked for a few minutes and waved them inside. As the women headed towards the door, they were startled by a loud mechanical roar. A convoy of at least 20 yellow Mustangs pulled into the parking lot. The third or fourth car in the column was a striking convertible. Melissa was almost in tears when she saw Jessica's long, wild hair flowing as the car passed them and pulled into the parking lot. Melissa's husband, Darren, was driving next to Jessica. He didn't even notice her when he passed by. He got out of the car and opened the door for Jessica. They entered the club through a side entrance and disappeared. Helen grabbed Melissa's hand and pulled her inside. After a few minutes, it became obvious that they would not be able to find a table. One of the guys Daniela was friendly with was sitting at a table by himself. They sat down with him. Danielle went to dance with him. The same guy who sat with Melissa last week walked up to her. Where did we leave off? He said, wrapping his arm around her. Get away from me, Melissa snapped. I don't need to risk my husband seeing you around me. Hearing that she was married, the man shrugged his shoulders and immediately left. It's too late, said Helen. Jesse saw this guy touching your breasts for the past week. I'm sure Darren already knows about it. Melissa's heart began to pound in her chest. It seems like everything she's going through now only adds to the reasons why Darren should want to be free of her. She suddenly realized that she had never been in control of anything. He simply chose to do what she wanted because he loved her. Now he had chosen not to, and she really wanted him to come back. He didn't need to ask her permission to do anything, but she needed him to forgive her and come home. It was his choice, so she didn't really control anything. Perhaps he was always the one in control. She stood up and began to look around the club. He had to be here somewhere, and she needed to talk to him. Waiting will not improve the situation and may even make it worse. A large group of people gathered at the right side of the small stage. The tables had been moved closer to this area, taking up part of the dance floor. Melissa had never seen anything like this at a club before and thought it might have something to do with Darren. She walked closer to the area and suddenly found herself in front of two huge bouncers who had their arms crossed over their chests. They looked at Melissa like she was an insect. No entry, said one of the bouncers. He turned away from her as if the conversation was over. Further discussion on any matter was excluded. Melissa looked at the people in the special sector. They didn't seem particularly special. There were representatives of different age groups. Obviously, there were rich people and those who clearly weren't. She couldn't understand what connected them. Then Melissa saw a familiar face. This was the woman who called her a bitch. The woman saw Melissa almost at the same moment, and they locked eyes. Elaine waved to Melissa and invited her to her table. Melissa pointed to the huge bouncers. Elaine put two fingers in her mouth and whistled loudly. The bouncers turned and she pointed at Melissa. The bouncers, head turned on his columnar neck, and in a voice that sounded like Lurch from the Adams family, he invited her inside. Thank you, Melissa said. Please don't be mad at me for asking this, but where is your husband? It's just weird seeing you without him. You know, I hear this all the time. I guess people don't realize that we both lived a long time and had lives before we met. We were both married before that, too. But it really seems like my life actually started with our first date. Anyway, Tim is backstage now, trying to keep Darren from passing out from excitement. Today is not a good day for Darren, Elaine said. First of all, I think you have a problem with him. I don't know what kind or how serious, so don't expect me to say anything. 
Then, apparently, Darren played guitar about 12 years ago, but never really played in front of people. Suddenly tonight, not only is he going to be in front of an audience, but there are also people from one or two record companies here. Elaine noticed that Melissa's eyes hardened and her lips tightened. Hell, maybe you still have a chance, Elaine said. What do you mean? Melissa asked. For a while I thought about you in the same terms as my ex. Maybe you didn't care about Darren and he'd be better off with someone else. But I noticed you were a little angry, so that maybe you do care a little after all. Don't worry, no one beat him up. We're not fighting. What happened was, Darren got a little happy about his car. It's a really nice car, by the way. He was trying to compete with Chrissy. It wasn't very nice. Chrissy beat him on one lap of the track, from a standing start, by more than ten seconds. Maybe Tim is just a better driver, Melissa said. Oh, that would be worse, Elaine said. I was into Chrissy at that moment. Oh, Melissa said, smiling. Anyway, I've changed my mind about you a little, Elaine said. I hope you at least get a chance to talk to him, but you shouldn't be here. You should probably try to get closer so he can see you. We took this area because we wanted to be here to support Darren. When you join the YMN, that is the Yellow Mustang Nation, you become part of the family. But we don't want to be too close to the stage and have to deal with all that pushing. Oh, if you miss it there, we'll all meet at midnight for a night cruise to our house. You're invited, but you need to keep your girlfriends away. Good luck. Melissa returned to her friends. Danielle wanted to know how she managed to get into the reserved area. Melissa ignored her and told Helen that Darren would be on the show. Before Helen could respond, the host walked onto the stage and introduced the first singer. He was a chubby guy with long, greasy hair, like he was stuck in an 80s time loop, singing Ozzy Osbourne's Crazy Train Off Key. The audience didn't even let him finish the first verse. They're in the mood for blood today, Sandra said. They usually give the first few brave souls a chance. Interestingly, today is different. Over the next hour, eight singers tried their hand. Of these, two were very good, and the audience showed their appreciation. The remaining six were met with varying degrees of approval, ranging from faint praise to outright disgust. Melissa expected the audience to tear apart the nearly 50-year-old man wearing pants, so tight it was obvious he had stuff at his groin. The old man had bleached hair and was trying to sing Rod Stewart's If You Think I'm Sexy. Another near-riot moment happened with a guy who was singing Poison Ride the Wind. From his first words, the crowd of people in front of the stage began to boo him. In response, he showed them his middle finger and exposed his butt. Several people in the audience appeared to follow him into the parking lot. No one knew whether it was because of his lewd behavior, terrible singing, or just his song choice. Then the room became quiet. Melissa looked around as several musicians left the stage and were replaced by others. The original musicians on stage were just names with no names who played their instruments well, but it was clear that it was just a job for them. The new guys on stage were slimmer and more angular. These guys looked more like wolves ready for a feast. They looked at the audience with almost unreadable expressions as they tuned their instruments. Then the light went out completely. When it lit up again, Darren was alone on stage. Melissa was really angry when several girls near the stage whistled at him. She didn't want anyone to whistle at her husband. She knew all too well the type of women who came to this club. Oh, damn, she was one of them. Darren smiled an innocent boyish smile and began to play. The only accompaniment was the almost silent, pulsating sound of the bass drum counting down the beat. It was an infectious tune, but not sensational. Melissa smiled at him, but he didn't notice her. The whistles from the girls near the stage began to irritate Melissa. Then it got worse. As soon as the vocals started, the monster bass line came in, and Darren's infectious melody turned into a solid guitar riff. The audience was delighted. Jessica suddenly appeared on stage next to Darren, waving all her hair and smiling at him. Darren also joined in and became more animated. The lyrics made Melissa feel sad. She seemed to be talking about Melissa and Darren's marriage from his point of view, while Jessica sang about frustration and not being listened to. Melissa knew that this was how Darren felt. 
By the time they reached the bridge of the song, the music had intensified and they were joined on stage by a bass player, a keyboard player, and another guitarist. The entire audience stood up and danced. Melissa felt bad. It was as if Darren was telling the entire audience through Jessica's seductive voice what a terrible wife she was. Nodding my head, not hearing a word I said. I can't communicate when you're waiting without understanding. I'm trying to talk to you, but you don't even notice, so... What will it be? Tell me, can you hear me? As Jessica sang those words, Melissa realized that this was exactly what Darren had been going through for the past few weeks. Was she really that bad at ignoring him? When they got to the chorus of the song, the audience was in awe. They were already trying to sing along to a song that none of them had heard five minutes ago. When Jessica sang the chorus, the entire club erupted. I'm so tired of this. Your attention deficit. Never listen. You never listen. I'm so tired of this, so I'm throwing a tantrum. Jessica tapped her feet and threw a mimic tantrum while she sang it. The smiles passed between Darren and Jessica made Melissa want to throw a tantrum of her own. You never listen, you never listen, Jessica sang, and Melissa's heart sank. I scream your name, everything remains the same, I scream and shout. So now I'm going to lose my temper, hey. Darren really lost his temper, Melissa thought. Like a cork popping out of a bottle when the pressure gets too much, her husband finally exploded and took their marriage with him. Melissa noticed that when Jessica sang the song, Darren moved his lips along with her, playing. She also noticed that he focused on her and sang directly to her. When the chorus ended with all the guys on stage shouting, Hey! The other guitarist came over to Darren and they played together. Jessica then began the second verse, singing about patience running thin. Does this mean Darren has already given up on her or is just tired of her actions? Jessica now walked over to Melissa singing the verse. She pointed at Melissa, and the audience around Melissa parted as Jessica walked down the stairs into the crowd. She walked straight up to Melissa, and when she reached the bridge of the song, she handed Melissa a folded set of papers. Melissa thought it was probably a copy of the song's lyrics. Jessica returned to the stage just in time to start the chorus. The audience was now singing along with her. It was surreal. More than 500 people, packed like sardines in a club, were singing about the breakdown of Melissa's marriage, which she herself had destroyed. Melissa could only stand and watch as Jessica and Darren worked the crowd into a frenzy. Some people around her tried to grab the papers Jessica gave them, as if it were a souvenir of some kind. When the song ended, Melissa was even more shocked. Jessica said her name through the loudspeaker. Melissa Thomas, Jessica's amplified voice said. Yes, Melissa said, knowing no one could hear her, but she was sure that Jessica and Darren could see her. You've been served, Jessica said. The words echoed over the crowd through the loudspeaker. Served, served, served. Then the group disappeared. The audience in the club was on their feet, cheering and screaming. Everyone congratulated each other and swore that Jessica was now their favorite singer forever. Several women, whom Melissa knew would sleep with a snake if they could hold its head in place, headed towards the backstage area. Melissa stood there, crying bitter tears. Jessica personally delivered what Melissa, upon opening, realized with horror were divorce papers. This meant that Jessica already considered herself part of the conflict. What Helen said about her sister, all of Helen's warnings came back. She won't start until you have the divorce papers in hand. Helen said. She is younger than us, more beautiful than us, and better built than us, said Helen. She's ready to settle down and start having kids, Helen said. Not with my husband. It won't happen, Melissa screamed. Melissa and Helen ran out of the club just in time to see a long line of yellow Mustangs leaving the parking lot. She knew where they were going, so there was no rush. They got into Melissa's car and left the club, leaving Sandra and Danielle to fend for themselves. They were silent the entire drive to Tim and Elaine's house. Melissa thought about everything she saw at the club tonight. She never thought it was possible, but her husband could leave for another woman. She was upset. She gave this man the best years of her life. He was her property. No one else was going to come and ruin it.
When she arrived at the house, it was surrounded by all those bright yellow muscle cars and a few others. She parked where she could and headed towards the house. Everywhere she looked, she saw people having fun. The more she saw, the angrier she became. She heard people cheering and saw them play games. She couldn't believe that all this was happening in the middle of the night. It was almost midnight. She noticed, however, that nothing overtly sexual was going on. Unlike the atmosphere at the club, it was all about fun and not sex. She saw Elaine and asked her if she knew where Darren was. He and Jessica weren't here, Elaine said. The band got a record deal because of their performance tonight. Darren and Jessica are still at the club negotiating contracts. Did you notice his Mustang isn't here? Melissa didn't say anything. She just turned around and walked away. She grabbed Helen and drove back to the club. She was even angrier now but had to admit that it was her fault. She assumed Darren would be with the others. The sad thing was that as much as he loved that car, she didn't even know what it looked like other than it was a convertible. When she returned to the club, the parking lot was empty. Behind her she saw a couple of limousines and a yellow Mustang convertible. She went to the door and knocked. One of the huge bouncers opened it and smiled at her. You're not giving up, are you? He asked. He turned to look inside and waved her inside. Melissa saw Darren and Jessica sitting at a table. Come on, Darren, Melissa said sharply. I'll ignore this episode just this once. Let's go home. We need to talk. Darren looked at her strangely. Melissa heard Jessica humming and singing softly. It was that damn song. I'm so tired of this. Your attention deficit. Never listening. Jessica sang almost inaudibly. Melissa, you got that p***ers, didn't you? The ones you got on the show don't count. They weren't served by a court officer. You'll get the real ones tomorrow at some point. This is truly the best thing that could have happened to us. You never, I wasn't really loved and I'm tired of being your damn lackey, Darren said. So you're just going to go off and play rock star with your little girlfriend here and forget about our marriage? Melissa asked mockingly. No, I already have a job that I'm good at. I don't want to be a rock star. It's too much work. But neither does Jess. She also has a career that she likes. The only thing we both don't have enough, it's each other. And as soon as our divorce is finalized, we're going to try. You should get a lawyer. I'm going to try to save the house, Darren said. He stood up and extended his hand to Jessica. And they left together, leaving Melissa alone with the bouncer over the next few days. Melissa found herself a lawyer. At first, he laughed at Darren's reasons for the divorce. He should have sued you for adultery. He probably wouldn't have been able to prove it, but he'd have a better chance of convincing a judge of it than of psychological abuse. After their first meeting with Darren and his lawyer, Melissa's lawyer advised her to try to reach an agreement. He has video footage of you in a club with several men doing things that, while not showing penetration, could lead someone to believe that you have broken marital obligations. No married man would want his wife to behave like that, like you. The worst thing is the recordings from your home life, which clearly show how you regularly shout and swear at him. You also humiliated him in front of others. The most damning evidence, however, is the testimony of the therapist you saw. Since you are covered by his health insurance and married to him, he has a right to information about your treatment. He shook his head. Just settle it and move on. If we go in front of a judge, you're not going to look good at all, he told her. Since there were no children and the divorce was uncontested, the case moved quickly through the courts. Three months later, once the divorce was finalized, Darren proposed to Jessica, and she accepted. As part of the divorce agreement, Darren bought out Melissa's share of their home. This gave her enough money to live for a while, if you can call it life. Melissa missed Darren so much, she could barely breathe. The worst part of it all was that damn song. Throughout the next summer, wherever she went, she heard that damn song. Darren and Jessica did not tour with the band. The band found another guitarist instead of Darren and some girl named Victoria as a singer but the recordings had Darren playing and Jessica singing. There was a video of them too, and that yellow Mustang. They performed on TV shows. They made a ton of money from the song and went back to their normal lives. She even moved into Melissa's house. 
Melissa moved in with Danielle for a while, but it didn't work out because neither of them could control the other. Melissa also blamed Danielle for ruining her marriage. Two years later, Jessica gave birth to the first of their three children, and they lived happily ever after. Melissa began to gain weight, and after her money began to dwindle, she had to take a job as a waitress to make ends meet. She often takes the bus to her old neighborhood and watches Darren and Jessica play with their children in the yard. She cries every time, but she can't stop coming. She also shudders every time she hears that song on the radio. 4-5. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.